Um, so hello. <laughs> um, it's great to see you guys. Thanks for coming out. Um, my name is Alan Drew. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the director of the, the program Creative Writing here at Villanova, and we're really excited to have our friends from, from the Seamus Heaney Center here today, um, coming all the way from Belfast, most of them, although I think Nick came from New York. So um, thanks, to, thanks to everybody at the Seamus Heaney Center for coming out tonight. Um, before I turn things over to Glenn Patterson, who is the director of the Seamus Heaney Center and will be, be sort of our MC tonight, um, I just wanted to take a moment to sort of give a context for the reasons why this program is happening tonight, or at least one of the reasons why. Um, last year, um, with help from, from Glenn and Rachel Brown, who was the center coordinator, where is Rachel? Hi, hi Rachel. Um, and with Joseph Lennon, who you just met, and also with my team teacher, Sarang Wangmo, who is out there somewhere, she's hiding back there. Um, we piloted a course last year called Running Through Conflict. It was a creative writing course, um, and it focused on, on literature that's, that's you know, interacting and sort of working through social political con conflicts. Um, we talked about the, the troubles, read literature about the troubles. Uh, we did Claudia Rankin's uh, Citizen, you know, obviously talking about race relations and various other things. And then we used that literature as sort of models and, and talking about breaking, breaking down craft um, for students' own creative writing work and then they workshop that work in the course. And with this course was an embedded, embedded travel element um, where we, I'm sure you've guessed it already, uh, we all went over as a class to, to Queen's University and the Seamus Heaney Center in Belfast for an intensive week of creative writing workshops, readings. Um, we have a film screening. Um, we had a rock concert. Um, and, and, and the students got to be sort of in the room with famous Irish writers, reading their work, and being immersed in this creative writing community. Um, and so the students that are going to be reading tonight were four students that are reading tonight actually went on this program last year. Um, and I think they might be reading some of the work they were working on when they were in Belfast. So if you want to know more about it and whether or not it was a great program, I thought it was great. I think with, with the, what they did in Belfast for us was just fantastic, an amazing program. Um, you can speak with them some more. And if your student is interested in going, you can't do it this spring, I'm sorry because we're not offering it, but we are offering it. Uh, we're going to run this program again in spring um, 2021. Um, so if you are interested, there are some pamphlets over there that will talk about it. Um, and there's also some information about the creative writing program here at Villanova. Um, I think that's all I had to say. Let's see if there's anything else. Hold on, let me look at my notes, if I can read them. Um, I think I said, I think Glenn's going to have some more things to offer to talk about other programs that were sort of working well, you're shaking your hands. <laughs> Former Heimbold chair. But a little bit later. What? I just want to say, Glenn was the Heimbold chair here in 2015? 16. And we were very fortunate to have him here then, and we're fortunate to have him back. And here he is. It's like stereo. Glenn Patterson. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. How are you? How are you doing? You all well? <laughs> it's good to see you. Um, there's a couple of seats up here at the front, just in case you thought you might just be able to come in and sit at the back. Uh, there are two seats up at the front if you'd like to come and sit up here. Um, listen, it's, it's lovely to see you all. Thanks a million for coming along this evening. Um, so my name is Glenn Patterson. I'm the director of the Seamus Heaney Centre at Queen's University in Belfast. And, um, and tonight uh, we, are, we are doing we are on, we're on a little mini tour um, and uh, we have uh, events in Belfast, which uh, are just the Seamus Heaney Centre presents, uh, which we've been doing since uh, January of this year. And uh, they, they were the, the creation of um, Rachel Brown, the centre's coordinator. And uh, the, really what we do is we have a theme for each of the events. And, uh, and writers have, uh, readers have seven minutes to, to read their work. Um, that responds in some way to the theme of the evening. So we were in uh, we were in New York last night, and oh, well, actually, just, with some of the themes that we've had, uh, we had Seamus Heaney Centre presents Bang. Uh, we had Seamus Seamus Heaney Centre presents Fold. We had the Seamus Heaney said we like four letter words. Um, so we had a lot of those. And then um, Alan's way into the cupboard, because I was just about to talk about him. Um, so, 
how well anticipated of him. Uh, so uh, <laughs> when, when, when everybody was over, uh, when we had the writing through conflict week um, in uh, March, oh, he's back out again. Uh, when we had the writing through conflict week through in, in March, uh, because we, we had Alan uh, coming, uh, we thought the Shimasini Centre presents draw uh, for Alan because we are nothing if not cheap when it comes to our titles. Um, so we had Shimasini Centre presents Drew. A draw, uh, and um, and last night uh, in New York we had Seamus Heaney's Center presents new, and uh, and here we are tonight, and it, this is the Seamus Heaney Center presents Nova, um, and uh, well we really actually I think our presence here tonight, everyone's presence here tonight at Villanova justifies the theme, so we don't have to do anything else, we don't have to explain why we're reading the things that we're reading, um, it's just Nova. And we're all here and uh, delighted to have uh, six readers tonight. Uh, there's a slight change to the running order. Um, some unforeseen events. Uh, Leontia Flynn, uh, one of our colleagues from the Seamus Heaney Centre, uh, won't be reading this evening. Uh, Leontia fell the night before last. I said fell there as though I invented that word. Fell. She fell. Uh, Leontia fell and, uh, and fractured her arm, uh, so she uh, couldn't do last night's event and she can't do tonight's event. But again, we never miss an opportunity. Um, we are going to have the Seamus Heaney Centre presents Lim uh, when we go back. Uh, Leontia Flynn in Lim, uh, which just sounds like that's halfway to the film already. I think you just have to just cast that. And you're, uh, cast? I never thought of that. Anyway, so yes, yeah, so we're going to have Seamus Heaney Centre presents Lim, uh, some other time. But anyway, so tonight, Shim Senior Centre presents Nova. Um, Rachel is sitting over there, um, and you will notice that there's a bell next to her, and that'll be the bell. And uh, if you go over your seven minutes, obviously I'm getting a wee bit of a bye-ball here at the moment, because I've spoken for at least that. Uh, if you go over your seven minutes, you will hear the, the bell will be dinged. Uh, so that's how we, we do our timings um, uh, for the Shim Heaney Centre presents. So... Without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first three uh, readers. Um, also, um, I, I believe one of our readers hasn't yet arrived. She might be babysitting. She's running here right now. She's running here. So, um, so, <laughs> so, yeah. um, so, so Maddie Dyer might be a wee bit. She'll be in the second half. Uh, but in the first half, um, we're going to start with, we're going to, we're going to, going to have a kind of like a Shimasini Centre sandwich with uh, Villanova in between. Um, and so we're going to start with uh, Stephen Sexton um, from Seamus Heaney Centre. Um, and S Stephen's going to be uh, followed by, Carolyn's going to read next, and then Courtney. So Carolyn Reaney and uh, Courtney Shunnewilf are going to read after that. And then we're going to take a little bit of a, an interval and we'll have a, a meander through some of the things that we've been talking about and some of the things that we've been doing in this uh, partnership. Uh, our, our motto <coughs> at the Seamus Heaney Centre uh, is this centre holds and spreads from Heaney's kinship. Um, and one of the great things about uh, this friendship and partnership that we've got going here between the Seamus Heaney Centre and Villanova uh, is indeed that um, uh, sense of things spreading, uh, opening up the doors and uh, uh, encouraging conversations between... There's uh, some friends arriving still at this moment, so I'm just... Um, I'm sort of, this is, this is what I think you'd officially call wittering. I am just wittering here until everybody's uh, got a seat and can sit down. And, um, and then we're going to start. You still happy? Yeah? Oh, there's two seats here. I've, uh, there's a couple more seats just, just here as well. So um, Stephen Sexton and Rachel and I came uh, on the train together from New York today. And we were in the quiet carriage. And we didn't realise that actually the quiet carriage really is like the quiet carriage. And, uh, and it did, I, I thought it said you were allowed to speak, but just not too loudly. Um, and we, were, we quickly realised just how, how, how loudly we, we generally speak. We were told off by the inspector before we'd even pulled out of the station. And, uh, uh, and then several, several people who were going on to Washington, D.C. Uh, pointed to the, to the quiet sign. Uh, to us, so um, yeah, and, and we still feel like we, we should be keeping it down. Uh, right, everybody seated. Um, so we're going to start our proceedings, and I'm going to invite my colleague, poet Stephen Sexton, to read, and then he will be followed straight away 
by Carolyn Rene and then by Courtney Sean Wolf. So would you please welcome our first three readers, starting with Stephen Sexton. Hello everybody, how are you doing? I'm I'm audible, right? Um, all right, thank you. Just making sure. Um, it is extremely lovely to, to be here. It is lovely to see many of you again, whom I saw in Belfast and met in Belfast uh, in March, which seems a long time ago and not a long time ago at exactly the same time. Um, it is lovely to be here. Um, I'm going to, on account of the rules, I'm going to read three uh, poems um, that I expect will be around seven minutes. Um, I expect no forgiveness, though. Um, the the connection to, uh, to to Nova, as Glenn has kindly um, dispelled, it might be it might be a very tenuous link. Um, the, the yeah, Nova Nunes, I'm not sure. Um, I'll start with one poem uh, about lots of animals. And then uh, to celebrate our friendship, uh, some about conflict, um, or not about conflict, but certainly involving it in some way. Um, so the first of these um, is uh, about loads of animals escaping a zoo. And I don't know either. I don't know. I don't know. But I did it. The curfew. The radicals sprung the locks that night, hurrah. And their lovely collarbones were almost moonly. Rhinos shrieked and bellowed, elephants tromboned, and the animals nosed into town. Sunrise to sunrise, and sunrise we kept indoors. If you can't count your onions, what can you count? My grandfather used to say. He said a lot of things. Among the other miners, he was legendary. When no more than the thought of the pink crumple of his infant daughter's body came to mind, a glow would swell in the pit. The men would mayhem bauxite by the light his tenderness emitted. Some of me lived inside her even then. The memorial fountain says nothing of the weeks before the rescue failed, but mentions God, which, as my grandfather used to say, <coughs> is just the name of the plateau you view the consequences of your living from, or something like that. He said a lot of things. He grew wise and weary as an albatross and left for that great kingdom of nevertheless. It would have pleased his handsome shoulders to watch this grizzly scoop for salmon in the fountain of his friends, or the Bengals, or the shakedown squad of chimpanzees who bang and bang on the grocery window. One by one, eleven miners starved to death. In the streets, they colour or tranquilise the ocelots and run a spike of ketamine through the plumbing in the fountain. Dromedaries blue mood around the pub, aloof under their reservoirs of fat. I don't sleep, but oh, Plateau, these days of violence have been my happiest. Even a cabbage is not without desire, my grandfather said one day. And now, among the animals, I feel under my wings the words for things I thought I knew departing, and I understand him. Okay, to the war then. Um, I'm, I'm going to read uh, two poems that I, you know, I don't really know where they've necessarily come from. Um, I don't know about you, I've, I've felt immense stress for at least the past three years, uh, largely uh, related to the whole Brexit thing and the whole world of politics. Um, I don't know how those things should necessarily occur in poems. Um, I don't think they can necessarily occur as, as content. Uh, often that's very difficult, but I, I think they can, they can sneak in. They can be at the edges or they can be in the language in some way or another. Um, so I'm going to read uh, to you in, uh, in the happy memory of the lovely week of conflict in, in Belfast that, uh, that some of us shared. Uh, the first one is about uh, watching uh, an apartment block opposite me, uh, watching an office block from, from an apartment block uh, being emptied. Um, probably should have gone to work or done something more useful with my time, but nevertheless I was looking out my window wondering, uh, wondering who blew it. <laughs> that caused this office block to, to be emptied. Uh, the poem is called The Dancers. All the syrup lighted afternoon, I watched the office block be dismantled into discretions. Half moon desks rolled like a fiberboard month across the gummy carpet. The clank and tango of a filing cabinet impressed by three stout men towards the backmost stairwell where the line of people standing one abreast snakes through the building's seven floors. 
I water the feeble mint and the oregano flowers and the hyacinths in the shade of my balcony, and the whippings start up again in the street below. On a bus somewhere or a train, you come towards me, and the second generation children singing pop songs on the mezzanine, approximating the dance routines, whose fortunes of language they cannot cherish yet. You'll say I've never felt such uncomplicated joy, and will stand there in the hall with your suitcases, listening to whatever rendition, whatever song. And you'll say, what a thing to share this flake of time in their company. What a thing wild lavender can still flourish in the grounds of a derelict church. I can have a little water. <clears throat> so one thing that I did when I was at school was I participated in the school musical which uh, is something I recommend that you all do um, if you don't have enough shame in your life or disappointment or <laughs> inadequacy or all that, all that sort of stuff. I played guitar in the, my school's version of The Sound of Music, uh, which was lovely. Um, I adored it. It was a, it was a marvellous thing. Um, I just want to say that it was kind of marvellous because the guy who, uh, I don't know how well you know uh, The Sound of Music, um, I guess there are two lead roles, kind of. There's Maria and there's Captain Von Trapp. Um, the guy who played Captain Von Trapp was, I guess, this remarkably quiet young man who, against the odds, nominated himself for the for the lead role in effect, you know, kind of the, the co-lead role, um, which was utterly bizarre. Um, but nevertheless, he did this. Um, and I guess I just remembered this a while ago because at certain points, um, there's one point uh, in the in the film uh, where he plays the guitar, um, and I was playing it for him while he pretended to play the guitar, <laughs> um, which is which is a nice thing. Um, but then a couple of years later, I saw him, you know, doing things on the, the street that, uh, that kind of disappointed me. So this is, uh, this is largely about that. Um, the other thing I'm going to do is quite early in the evening. Uh, this, uh, this poem ends on a, a rather abrupt, shall we say, word. Um, out of politeness to you all and for our enduring friendship, I'm going to replace it with a word that rhymes with the word that it is. Um, I, think from the, I think the context will be clear enough. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, it's called High School Musical. Milk toast isn't the word. Retiring diffident wouldn't say boo to a goose. However it happened, he was transformed. Six brass buttons on his double-breasted prop naval officer's jacket glinted in the stage lights, and the bosun's whistle he brought to attention his children with could be heard in this life and the next. In those days I looked up to him, wooden, Kissing Maria not quite on the mouth. In those days I was his right hand. While he dumb-thumbed a Spanish guitar and sang Edelweiss for the fatherland, I hunched on a stool in the orchestra pit and waltzed through the ache in my forearms. Von Trapp fled Europe for America. So mountains were unfastened and folded, violinists slackened their bow hairs, handshakes grew infrequent. After the show, I felt such an emptiness. I wanted Nebuchadnezzar's of sweet Alsatian Riesling to toast and swill with the captain and crew. But he was the sort for a prayer before bed and a tick in the box marked extracurricular. I expect he married and volunteered for a mission in Zimbabwe or Chad. I went on about water into wine or the one about the wheat and the chaff until the miracles of nighttime and shame brought twins each splendider than the other, and the big subpoena of the Lord called him back to his native parish. The last time I saw Daniel, a decade thence, he was preaching brimstone and worse from the bandstand with a captain's steel and bearing. I must be born again, Daniel, I know, but wouldn't it be my luck to be born into a golden age goldener than the afterlife, so lovely, so ducked. Thanks. Hi, 
I'm Caroline. I did the program last spring. I really recommend it for when it's back in 2021. I'm actually graduated, but I go to the law school like right next door, so I had no excuse when Alan Drew emailed us all. And um, I'm going to read a slam poem that I actually began writing when I was in Belfast and inspired by some Belfast conversations. And I performed it last spring at our like annual Sam Poetry competition. So if you guys like Sam Poetry, you should totally do that. Got second place, so thank you, Belfast. So uh, I guess disclaimer, some potentially inappropriate content, conflicting. So uh, here I go. It's called Sex Education from My Senior Year Religion Teacher. <laughs> to begin the lesson from Corinthians, for man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. I remember Mrs. Syracuse, a religion teacher at my all girls high school, her back hunched, her hooded eyes bruised, and her blue paisley sweater complimenting her white scarf of hair, standing at the front of the classroom, full of plaskers, converse sneakers, and distracted eyes pointed at open laptops, switching from our standard lesson saying, I'm not having you girls leave here without knowing. She meant not the mystery of faith, but the mystery of our holes meant to reproduce more souls like the heads bowed above wooden pews. For that morning, she had taken upon herself to make her smugness the savior of our sinful skirts, ignoring our freshman biology lessons, believing that we knew nothing of the basics of sex. And then she began her lesson. He does what, girls? When he's on you, what does he do? And she goes on, voice droning and listless, to inscribe the hardened married penis with the power to penetrate our pliable personalities, altering our girlish form for our purpose of motherhood. She asks us, what happens next, girls? What does he do? The penis does what? And she had us fill in her questioning blanks. I personally contributed ejaculates to said blank, while knowing that the Lord, creator of life, does not wish him to shoot blanks into our limp bodies unmoving, because as the book of Peter said, Holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. For male and female bodies were melded and welded for repopulation, and the only acceptable form of birth control is natural family planning, ensuring that you've reproduced before your biological clock stops ticking and you've exhausted your purpose, your submission, something I thought of not long after I had sex for the first time. Unwed. After popping birth control pills into my lips and using the church condemned condom, knowing what he and I did in eyes of the church was sweet sin. Also after sex for the first time, her muddied speech merciless in my mind, her endless diatribe, I began the first draft of this poem but didn't add these lines until I revised over her relentless rhetoric revolving around hypocrisy. For our lesson was that the Virgin Mary was venerated solely for her unplugged vagina, while mine and my soul is invigorated and vengeful. Reminding others how we all conveniently forgot how Mary conceived of her other children, the ones that came after Joseph came after sacred conception of Jesus, whose body was godly because his mother still might have had her hymen. But still, Mrs. Syracuse reminded us, I'm not having you girls leave here without knowing. And she made sure that we knew we had to be entwined through I do's to a man destined to prod us for the purpose of procreation as the audience at a wedding sings the Bible's lesson from Ephesians, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. A request to ensure a woman births his children, the only way to make something of a woman's life as long as she does it right, because alignment between male and female bodies for the creation of life is symbolic of our Lord's love lording over our flesh laced with free will. So that when Mrs. Syracuse discussed IVF something she turned forbidden, she called my friend, her plaid skirt below her knees, unnatural. Thank you. Hi, I'm Courtney, and I'm going to read an excerpt from a story I started writing in Belfast called Fire Trucks Don't Stop at Red Lights. You don't seem to want to talk, Daniel said matter-of-factly. Allie looked up at him. She swallowed tightly, uncertain. She didn't want to talk, but she didn't want to do anything else either. Her eyes, his eyes were questioning, excited, hesitant. She tried to look away, but then she started picturing her friend, Madison, with the boy on the couch. She heard Madison's voice challenging, loosen up. She, saw, she thought that maybe she wanted to. She turned her gaze back to the boy, held it, and didn't move as he closed the distance between them. She kissed him back. She felt him shift his weight so that he leaned across her, hovered over top of her. She felt his hands. They trailed along her midriff, lingered on her chest, moved to her thighs. As they traveled upward and inward along them, she felt herself shrinking, her body growing smaller and smaller until she was seated on a blue stool at a cafeteria table in middle school. One of the popular boys sat to her right, and she was turned to face him, a coy smile on her lips as he raised an eyebrow tauntingly. Let's play a game, he said, his voice cracking on the last syllable. 
What kind of game? She asked. Her stomach fluttered with a nervous thrill as this boy directed his full attention at her. She usually sat in his periphery, his gaze zeroed in on one of her friends. It's the fire truck game. I start with my hand here, he directed as he placed his open palm on her knee, and moved it up and move it upwards slowly. Say red light when you want me to stop. Allie stared at his hand, resting on her bare knee, and that space between the hem of her uniform skirt and the top of her sock. Okay, she said, her eyes pinned to his hand. She couldn't meet his eyes as her cheeks warmed. Okay, he said. Allie didn't see him flick his gaze to the enthralled audience of middle schoolers seated around their lunch table. She didn't see him smirk either. He started to move his hand up her leg ever so slowly, trailing only his fingertips along her bare skin. Allie felt the hair on the back of her neck, hidden beneath her ponytail, rise in goosebumps. His hand reached the hem of her skirt. He barely hesitated before he slipped it beneath the flap, changing his path to her inner thigh. She hadn't expected him to go beneath her skirt. Red light, Allie gasped as she slapped her legs together, trying to force the progression of his fingers to stop. She snapped her eyes to his. Hers were big, wide, and round, like the shape of her mouth as she sat, stunned. His were squinted, mischievous, a bit mocking. Fire trucks don't stop at red lights, he sneered as he shot his hand even further up her skirt. She felt his fingertips brush the soft cotton of her Walmart underwear. Her mother hadn't let her switch the more expensive kind yet. She jerked away from his hand, slipping off the stool and barely catching herself on the table. What the? She narrowed her eyes, questioning, but the laughter of her friends broke the tension. Allie felt like crying. She felt the telltale pinpricks, but her friends were laughing, so she laughed. She pushed her bangs out of her face, took a stabilizing deep breath in, and repositioned herself on the stool. She crossed her legs, pressed them tight looked everywhere but at the faces of her classmates at the table. She angled her body away from the popular boy, knees and ankles pointed at the opposite side of the cafeteria. She spent the rest of the period in silence, occasionally stabbing a piece of lettuce with her fork, only to let it fall back on the plate before she could bring it to her lips. She felt different hands, much larger hands, exploring her body now, and it brought her back to the present. She wanted to tell him no. Her heart beat out a rhythm that spelled S-T-O-P. Her lungs pressed against her ribcage, tried to push the migrating hands away from her chest. Internally, her body railed against the hands, rejected the roaming. Her insides flashed red, screamed stop, but externally, everything froze. Her mouth was dry, her tongue heavy, stuck behind her lips. She couldn't make her arms or legs move. Her mouth and her limbs knew what the rest of her body didn't. She closed her eyes, tried to calm her insides, accepted her faith, until the hands started to slow and the pressure of the boy's body lifted. Suddenly, he was very far away. Are you okay? He stood a few steps back from her now, staring intently into her eyes. He crouched low, searched her face, gave her a minute to respond. Seriously, you don't look so good. She was still stunned, but she started shaking her head. We don't have to do this, he said. I, I think I want to go, she stuttered, breathless. Okay. He paused, then. But you did come to my bedroom. She snapped her eyes to his. You said we didn't have to do anything. Yeah, but then you leaned into me. You kissed me back. You seemed like you wanted to. I changed my mind. Okay, and I'm letting you, so no problem, right? She let his question hang in the air as she tried to comprehend it. Finally, she said, right, I just want to go. I'll walk you out, he offered. She hesitated. Okay. He led the way out of the house, drawing most of the attention away from her. She appreciated his gesture, and as she followed behind him, head down, she kept replaying his accusations in her head. She never said no. She wanted it at first. She wanted to be like Madison and had led him on, gave him mixed signals from the beginning. She was a flashing yellow light. She felt grateful that, despite her mixed signals, her indecision, he stopped. When they reached the front porch of the house, she turned to him. Daniel? Yeah? Thank you. Daniel's brow wrinkled in confusion. He looked as if about to say <coughs> something more, but was cut off too soon. Oh, so you've got girls thanking you now? You're that good? Asked the random fraternity brother on the porch, drunk from the jungle juice. Daniel glanced in Allie's direction before turning back to the guy, the porch light casting ugly shadows across Daniel's face as it transformed into a sneer. Allie felt her thank you turn sour on her lips, sit like a rock in her stomach. She heard Daniel say, you know how it is. Thank you so much, Karen and, and Courtney, and to Stephen Sexton as well. Um, I, I remiss of me to say, um, Stephen Sexton just won the Felix Dennis Award, the Forward uh, Arts Foundation Poetry Prize, first collection uh, he won for If All the World and Love Were Young, uh, just last Monday, Monday before last. So, round of applause for it. <laughs> I feel like a game show host. 
Round of applause for Stephen Sexton. Um, uh, I, I'm actually like a game show host. I'm, uh, I'm going to announce a couple more big, 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 big prizes. Um, so after our brilliant week uh, in March, uh, when uh, students from Villanova were over, such a great, great week, and um, it was it was brilliant for us at the Seamus Heaney Centre. Um, not only did the students get to work with um, our creative writing staff, they also got to work with some of our PhD students. Um, and uh, it, it was absolutely fantastic. And at the very, very, very last night, uh, we had a reading uh, in the old staff common room uh, in Queen's University, Belfast. And it was organised by two of our PhD students, by Stephen Connolly and Manuela Moser, who have a regular series of readings just called The Lifeboat. And so we had a Lifeboat special featuring the students from Villanova. It was an absolutely brilliant evening. After that, um, the university um, had a chat with us, uh, with Rachel and with me um, at the Seamus Heaney Centre about how to strengthen that uh, relationship. And uh, one of the things that they came up with uh, was the suggestion that we would have a bursary of £5,000 uh, annually um, for a student from Villanova coming to Queen's University to study on the MA in Creative Writing, uh, which is a great investment on the part of Queen's University. <laughs> Uh, no, we're delighted about that. It's absolutely brilliant. So starting from uh, the academic year 2021, uh, there's going to be a, a bursary of £5,000 available to um, uh, a student from Villanova who's interested in applying for creative writing. At Queen's, uh, at the Seamus Heaney Centre, um, we, uh, obviously it's the Seamus Heaney Centre, as you would expect. Uh, poetry is at the centre of, uh, of what we do, but uh, we have all other forms of writing represented in our, in our faculty. Um, we have prose writers, we have script writers, um, we have people who are interested in, in working in narrative, in games, and all kinds of things. So we're interested in all kinds of writing. And uh, likewise, um, anybody who's interested in coming to study with us uh, on the master's course, um, we, we welcome um, applications from, from people of all writing uh, forms as well. So um, as Alan said, we're going to do it again. We enjoyed it so much, we're going to do it again. Uh, we enjoyed it so much, we couldn't uh, actually didn't have the energy to do it in 2020. So um, we're, we're going to do it in 2021. Um, I think spring break uh, runs from the 28th of February um, in 2021. Uh, so we're going to have a, a week where we welcome again uh, students from Villanova to the Seamus Heaney Centre. Uh, and we're delighted about that. Um, so when we do these things um, at the, uh, normally we do them at the Crescent Art Centre in Belfast, um, and, uh, and we nearly always have a, a special guest uh, to do something. Last night at, um, uh, in New York, we had the artist Colin Davidson, um, who painted the last portrait of Seamus Heaney. Um, and uh, he talked about the, the, the portrait um, of, of Seamus Heaney that he had done. Um, unfortunately, Colin couldn't join us here this evening, um, but um, I was talking just before we started to Donald Gill, um, who tells me that um, he's known for reciting Heaney poems in pubs around Philadelphia, and Donald is going to come and give us digging. Well, there you go. Uh, we sort of made it up as we went along here, but, um, well, why not? Um, uh, so would you please welcome Donald Gill? Wow, this is a surprise. Usually if I'm going to recite something, I take the opportunity of reading it a day or two before. <laughs> but I don't think I've read Digging in a month, but... Uh, <laughs> Also, I usually have a Guinness that helps uh, <laughs> lubricate the mind, but uh, I'll, I'll give it a go, and if I stumble, I trust you'll be forgiving. You will be, okay. Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice young blonde woman says, yes, I'll be forgiving. That uh, makes me uh, really want to 
want to go on. <laughs> Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests, snug as a gun. Under my window, the clear rasping sound when a spade sinks into the gravelly ground. It's my father digging. I look down till his straining rump among the flower beds bends low, then up twenty years away, stooping rhythmically through the potato drills where he was digging. His coarse boot nestled on the left, on the luff, the shaft against the inner knee levered firmly. He'd bring the bright edge clean. Oh boy. <laughs> Uh, through the roots, a little louder, and I'd be. Can you tell me what he said? He's doing. The living roots. Yeah, that. Oh my God. The living roots awaken in my head, right? To bring it back. Through living roots awaken in my head. I have no spade to follow men like them. Oh, that's that's. That's way in the back. Okay. Yeah. No, no. Let me freeze. It root out the tall tops. How's that? And bring the bright edge clean, scattering the new potatoes, which we'd pick, loving the cool hardness of them in our hand. By God, the old man couldn't handle a spade. Just like his old man, my grandfather could cut more turf in one day than any other man in Tuna's bog. One morning I brought him a bottle of milk, corked sloppily. He straightened up, drank it down, then, oh no, I don't even trust it. I refuse. <laughs> He straightened up, drank it down, then fell to right away, nicking and cutting neatly, heaving the sod over his shoulder, going down, down for the good turf, digging. The cold smell of potato mold, the squelch and slap of soggy peat. Now we can switch to you. <laughs> the clean, the sound of Spades cutting through living turf, all these awaken in my head. But I've no spade to follow men like them. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests. I'll dig with it. Yeah. Was he shy? Oh, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Sorry. yeah. yeah. No, when Shane when was first read here, right. years ago, in this right. building. Right. Donald, thank you so much. I, I, I did, I did, I, I, I sprang that on you, rather. Um, but, but thank you, thank you so much. And I, I did think it was a pint of Guinness that was being produced for me, and I didn't know it was a, 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 a copy of Digging. But uh, listen again. Donald Gill, please, round of applause. <laughs> of bags of drink here and it'll be very like the, uh, the, the, the Crescent Arts Centre when we normally do these Seamus Heaney Centre events. Um, so listen, thank you very much uh, so far. Uh, so we're going to have our it's kind of club sandwich. So um, we, we, um, we had Heaney Centre and then Villanova and then Donald uh, and, and now we're going to have Villanova and Heaney Centre to, to finish um, this part of the evening because who knows where we go after this. Um, so I just want to introduce uh, our next three um, readers. Hiya. How was the baby sitting? Oh, it was great. Okay, okay. So, um, um, so yes, we're going to have Reagan Wish, and then we're going to have Madeline Dyer uh, to read, and then we're going to finish with Nick Laird, colleague from the Seamus Heaney Centre, uh, Professor Nick Laird, uh, recently appointed to the Seamus Heaney Centre, 
as chair of creative writing um, and uh, and uh, and he because um, we are spreading um, he is the chair of creative writing uh, at the Shimasini Centre living in New York uh, so we're delighted to have uh, Nick on the uh, with us at the Shimasini Centre so now we're gonna have those three readings in that order uh, so would you please welcome first we're gonna have Regan Wish and then we're gonna have Madeline Dyer and then we're gonna finish with Professor no, God help us, just Nick Laird. Okay. <laughs> Hello. So, as uh, mentioned by Courtney and Caroline, we wrote a lot about conflict. And so um, I decided to write on rape as an introduction to her rape. I will live by shattering and remaking this world with only the parts that I find beautiful by dancing to any music I hear, by making others hear the music I am dancing to, and by making others hear the music they refuse, by protecting my sister, by protecting the woman who is not my sister but could have been, by experiencing the night sky and the rain, by surviving a shark attack, by surviving a frat party, by drinking cheap beer, cheap beer and by drinking tea, by meeting my soulmate, by then losing them in a crowd, by writing poems that no one else will understand, and by writing poems that everyone will understand. By pretending I am Audrey Hepburn. By admitting I could never be Audrey Hepburn. By knowing I am lucky. By knowing some people are not. Her rape. Her rape was not what she thought it would be. Instead, the stage was set familiarly, the desk spartan armed with tomorrow's assignments, the laundry empty, just washed, the almond chapstick on the nightstand. Her comforter kicked away the November night too hot for sleeping. The sheets were damp and there was mascara on her pillow. It seemed as if she had forgotten to turn the air on. Teddy Bear had been pushed to the floor mid-dream and nothing looked unusual. Her rape was not what she thought it would be, instead the costume was her own. Her favorite jeans, light fade, high-waisted with a belt, a navy tee announcing loyalty to Villanova. Socks dotted with owls, she was wearing her favorite underwear to help her on a math test tomorrow. And they were torn. It seemed as if she didn't realize they were getting so old. Her hair was messy, her scalp sore, and nothing looked unusual. Her rape was not what she thought it would be, instead the actor was well known. With a grin that volleyed jokes, with nails that were bitten too often, with hair cropped short and generically brown. She never noticed his height in comparison to hers, nor did she previously care that he could bench her body's weight. It seemed as if she was confused by how he got so strong. He left her room with a smile, and nothing looked unusual. Her rape was not what she thought it would be, instead hers was not a speaking role, whispers unheard, her vocals redacted, and her whimpers unmiked. Her shitty speakers hummed a soundtrack at odds with untuned bedsprings. It seemed as if she was no longer an actor, no longer an agent, recast backstage a prop. She could not hear or say a thing, and nothing looked unusual. Her rape was not what she thought it would be. It was real. As a postscript to her rape, I will live with fear that is not fear because it does not paralyze, with the constant affirmation that this is do or die, with the knowledge that I have no choice but to move forward because everything moves forward, with the terror that comes with not knowing, with the detachment that grows arabesquing from my religion and my magic, with the ache of what I have lost and what I will never again gain, with Abba playing loudly in the background, with red lipstick and high heels, with biting cynicism and unquestioning optimism, with kinetic energy that illuminates every movement, with the fecklessness of youth, with the recklessness of learning, with the ache of faith. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, babysitting was wonderful. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm just going to do a few poems that I had the privilege of writing and workshopping in Belfast with the rest of my class. Um, so the first one is called St. Rita's School. The Monday morning kaleidoscope filters in, 
blurring the worn faces of a traveler's commute. Faded blue, burnt orange, consuming gray. The land of luck looks different here, the rainbow relegated to the puddle. Like in the schoolyard, where squeals of girls whose plaid kilts, polyester, cold wash, would get impossibly wet. Those bad habits before Sister Mary so-and-so would usher us into the grotto and we'd repeat, Vincent always the loudest, the contest for heaven. The hymns and prayers that I hear now shattered against the oncoming traffic, wondering where within this collage of faith I stand. And then the second one is called Enough. Guilt looks a lot different from the four foot days of me reaching on tiptoe to snag the last cookie with iron fists so sure that nothing could go wrong. She appeared on the cloudy day with my mother, who was warned from those early days of hoping maternal lessons in shopping malls and school halls would be enough. Guilt dresses differently now, clothed in a floral rayon dress, colors oscillating in such vibrancy it made me forget the negligence of this fast fashion facade. Renewed in this golden hour of friendship, she swings along with fate, sauntering into dorm halls and dim bars, so that even when my resolve is there, she weighs on my chest a tranquilizer without tranquility. And I am bought into the cheap belief that I will never be enough, I say, as I pick myself up from the rocks I was swinging over the hopes of reaching the current. I wait, I breathe, I ignore the stairs and two lit tunnels. I remind myself I'm good and in the small constellation of consolation enough. Okay, and the last one is kind of an ode to my roommates um, and a little ritual we had last semester. So this one's called Fizz. There's nothing more satisfying than the crisp pop of a seltzer can after a long day when it's finally acceptable to sit on the couch next to you and say, hey, I hope your day was nice too. And if not, maybe we can try again tomorrow where once more I'll crack open a cold one and delight in this fizz of friendship. Thank you. Hey, um, it's lovely to be back in Villanova. I read here, I was just trying to, maybe it must be 10 years ago, Alan, you were here. Yeah, lovely to be back. Nothing's changed, uh, anyway, for me. Um, so, um, I'll just read three, three poems. I have a poem that ends with the same word that Stephen's poem ended on. <laughs> so I might read that, and let's see how it goes. Um, I'll read a wee short thing first. The first um, poem is a, is a kind of mo moaning poem. I wrote it after my mother died a couple of years ago. It's from the, the, the new book, it just came out in the summer. So It's called Silk Cut. Um, Silk Cut is a, is a brand of... Um, a British and Irish cigarette that my father uh, smoked for 50 years. I was five and stood beside my dad at a junction somewhere in Dublin when I slipped my hand in his and met the red end of a cigarette. But now our hearts are broken. We walk down to the Bray side where we can get a proper pint and his voice tears up a bit about the emptiness in the house. And we are going home waiting at the turn for the traffic, when I find I have to stop my hand from taking his. I like to do commissions, and I'm going to read a couple of wee commissions. Um, you know, Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal, um, it's an anniversary of that, and his modest proposal is that we start to eat the Irish babies. He suggested that there were so many of the Irish on the streets in Dublin um, that, it, that a way that um, we could sort out both the poverty and the famine was to just eat the babies. Um, kind of the beginning of satire in some way, that um, long essay, but um, we had to, a few of the Irish poets wrote up-to-date versions for the, for the radio, and this is one of them. I, I wrote about um, smartphones. <coughs> Small plan to destroy you completely. What I propose is to gift you this magic stone. You'll stare into its inky depths and find yourself reflected back, mesmerized by the intensities of your own wide-eyed reflection. Even the gods need a rest from themselves. 
They manifest as a burning bush or a swan or a drop of rain. But you'll remain yourself, always alone, always seeking your suffering, forking it from a pocket to scrutinize it hard before walking head first into a lamppost. I will not offer real rewards, but only symbols of rewards, and this will make no difference. Here is a raised thumb. Here is a yellow circle with two small black dots, a sickle-like slash. Working from ethically dubious but statistically incontrovertible experiments like the Milgram and Stanford prison experiments, I know most people will pile on to any victims since they fear the real pain social anxiety brings. The rest will stand around and chant, fight. I propose there is much unplanned in the transformation out of advertising into direct behaviour modification, and it will cause an explosive amplification of negativity in human affairs. I propose to make you into an asshole or a fake nice person. Addiction can be hidden for a bit, but the disposition shifts, and one will notice. Justify it as the price of this, a kind of rhythm to one's life founded on a nervousness, compulsive pecking at the soul's scabs, an itch for affirmation as you grow more focused on portentous events invisible to those around you. You will stare into the stone like one who spots the bright sky reflected in a well and cannot look away when overhead the whole unclouded blue continues on without you. I'll do that wee poem um, with the bad word at the end and I'll do the same thing Stephen did because <laughs> I'd like to do what Stephen does. <laughs> Uh, someone told me I had to write a poem called The Politics of Feeling for Grantha Magazine. This is The Politics of Feeling. Um, sort of, I moved to America 10 years ago, really. I teach at NYU, and I was very taken with uh, being Irish in America. In some way, it's sort of interesting being Irish in America as opposed to just being Irish. Um, this poem is dedicated to Bannon, Conway, Kelly, McConnell, Mulvaney, Pence, and Ryan. Um, yeah. They sound like the Seven Dwarfs when you put it like that. Um, this is called The Politics of Feeling. I'm going to level with you now about the despicable phoniness of those who declare they're going to level with you now. Also, let me make it abundantly clear that those who say, let me make it abundantly clear, are shitting in your milk. There's a sickness at the core of this, but let them scream whatever they want. We will size it up beautifully. We will size it up without frenzy or sloth or pretense and let it be noted that it has been noted. I am sitting here very still in the question of myself and by the time this poem appears I expect I will be even whiter. As you are aware the Irish only recently got to be white but some of us seem to be liking it an awful lot. My sandwich is finished, but I sit on in the middle of the square, decentered by the lassitude of Thursday and this recur recurring sinus infection. Abroad remains the trio of affinities, the body one inhabits, God, the cause or lack thereof, of all level of outrageous detail, and the other animals who walk around me endlessly in circles. The day is a massacre of clarity, clouds erupting out of their skin, Whiteness on whiteness, over the dogs in the dog run, growling and sniffing and crapping, over the jet of the fountain, endlessly replenishing the crest of itself in whitely continuous effort, the <clears throat> curled up leaves at your feet, desiccated reds and browns, patches of exhausted grass, the Japanese jazz band, the texture and temperature of the bench. Why is there this? A sensation? A pleasure? See if that stands up. I hold in my palm, a few at a time, the facts of cashew nuts from the bag of facts of cashew nuts. Everything already is fraying at the edges, if not completely gone. Everyone is mourned, mourned in turn, and that stench is the stench of decay from the trash can. Something rotting in a bag of skin. Look at it and away. 
If someone despises you, the work is still to do nothing despicable, to be oppositional but patient and cheerful as your own mother if she wasn't pretending. But what then? What is next? I no longer find it surprising that one of the Wi-Fi networks coming up as my home option is Class War 5G. Yesterday, I noticed another had appeared <coughs> named Patriotic Socialist. I am telling myself to get up and go when a guy slopes past pushing his kid in a stroller like I used to. The lovely dullness of those interviews just shoving the stroller into the future. On the next bench, a squirrel surveys us, sits on its hunkers, munches. I flick half a cashew off my sleeve and into infinity and snap the Tupperware container shut and stand up to brush myself off before walking out into Manhattan like a good European as the rich get richer and the poor get ducked. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Well, that cleared the room. <laughs> oh, all those unsaid words at the end of those poems, I just feel like sending them all in a big line. Um, that is um, the end of proceedings for this evening. Um, thank you all very much indeed for coming along. Um, as I say, apologies for a few of the changes to the, to the lineup, but thanks to those who uh, weren't actually listed on your programme sheet, uh, who did read this evening. Um, can I just say how lovely it is to see so many friends here this evening um, and, um, and to be back here. Uh, I think all of us um, uh, are delighted, those of us from, from the Seamus Heaney Centre, uh, to be back, and particularly to be um, back and seeing some of the students from Villanova who came over for the Writing Through Conflict Week uh, last March. Uh, we're really looking forward to the 2021 rematch. Um, we fully intend to come back here and read at you again uh, in the very near future. Um, and um, I want to thank, uh, as I always must, as we always must, um, Rachel Brown from the Seamus Heaney Centre who has not had to ding her bell once this evening. So thank you all for keeping to your timings. Um, thank you very much indeed to Regan Wish, to Caroline Reaney, to Courtney Schoenewolf, to Madeline Dyer, uh, to Stephen Sexton, to Nick Laird, and particularly to Donald Gill for digging. Thank you all very much and thank you for coming. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks a million. <laughs>